Ah, well, all right, that's official. I guess we're starting. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, the agenda is in the voice chat if you want to follow along there. If you don't, that's completely fine too. Um, so as usual, we're going to start with a review of all the proposals and the drafts that we have currently in process. Um, so we are now in the middle of voting on KIPP 26, which is the extension of KIPP 21. It's our uh, our way of extending the leadership's authority for another six months. We had a really good conversation about this last week. Um, the SOFONs reviewed it over the weekend, were enthusiastically in support, and so this is out for voting now. Uh, we have, um, yeah, I think we have some interest on Snapshot, but we could definitely use more because um, it would be great to have, um, you know, as comprehensive a sense of the community's support or lack thereof as, as possible. So please do go vote. Um, we also have on the forum two relatively new proposals from the Treasury. So one is to create a testing wallet. Another one is brand new as of today, although Matt's been talking about it a while, and that is the Treasury Charter. So Matt, do you want to say a bit about that one? Yeah, sure. And uh, apologies, I'm on the road right now for a couple of minutes. So I might have a little background noise. But yeah, I, I think uh, really, I know I've kind of nailed this home a couple of times, but really just... I think most DAOs and organizations kind of need to have a North Star uh, or at least some specifically stated uh, mandates on how they view their treasury. I think we all kind of go through this process uh, just trying to use our best judgment and trying to understand. And I think we all have these kind of core principles in mind, but putting pen to paper and outlining our core principles and, you know, really what we see as our treasury's use case really being, I think is something that's kind of undervalued in this space. So I think it was kind of time <clears throat> to more formally outline our thoughts, or at least my initial thoughts on what I believe uh, the community would want out of a, a Treasury Charter. So that, that's a high level what this is supposed to try to represent. Great. Yeah, thank you. And I know Matt and his his team have been working on this for a really long time. So it's it's well worth going and taking a look. And, and once that's ready, it'll go through the regular governance process. It also um, prompted us to change a little bit in how we think about some of the categories. Um, so we'll come back to that in a later section of the workshop. Um, in terms of other things that are upcoming, there's the yeah, bank. Of... Yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry. yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to um, kind of highlight one thing about this uh, just to reinforce is, you know, this, this is relatively high level. This is kind of acting like our vision culture around how we see our, our treasury, but there'll be more explicit parameters and guidelines coming in another file, which is, you know, going to be called the treasury management framework. So I would say the, the meat of the details and more explicit parameters and bumpers that we can work in will be represented there. And then we will also be tweaking uh, the mission-based budgeting KIP that has been on the forum for a little bit uh, to, to be more comprehensive and kind of in line with some of the updates we've had from both the treasury charter, the treasury management framework, and, and some of the other things that we've been doing on the treasury side. Uh, so just another point to emphasize there. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's really, it, it's, um, you know, we, Wes and I were looking at things today, we realized that there's, you know, a whole category of documents that we're starting to talk about internally in terms of things like the Treasury Charter. So there's the, we're hoping to have a, a charter or a constitution soon. We've got a mission and value statement to work on. And so there are a number of things that are going to be kind of evergreen documents that aren't about doing some specific thing. Uh, but are more about things that need ratification and buy-in by the whole community. So um, Matt's really kind of pioneered this in terms of working on the Treasury Charter. Um, but yeah, this is something we're going to see a lot more of in the future. Um, okay, and then in terms of things that are upcoming, there's the Bancor fund withdrawal and the non-core asset proposal. Starfire, do you have any? You've been working really hard on these and they're looking good. Do you have a sense of when those are going to go online? I may be muted there. So I think, uh, as I understand it, those are going to be online probably in the next 24 hours, hopefully. So they're they're both looking very good, and it'll be well worth people's attention. I apologize. I was muted and, and talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I was just saying, I don't know how crowded we, we want the form to be, but those are both ready to go and, and can be posted ASAP if if that works. Yeah, go for it. I think it would be good. Beautiful. Yeah, because we have a yeah we have a nice mix of things, but those are also pretty important and, and worth getting online. 
one one thing maybe we can discuss here um but i do want some guys you're breaking up a little bit there oh uh can you hear me now yeah better okay um, yeah, I'll just restart. So I guess with all the different proposals, especially on the Treasury side, kind of already on the plate of the, the, the SOFONs as well as some other ones that are coming onto their plate, um, maybe good here or during Treasury Tuesday to discuss how, how we, at least as a community, want to prioritize these. Um, you know, obviously they have limited bandwidth on what they can review and put forward or not, um, but m maybe some guidance on what the highest priority would be good and helpful to discuss. Sure, sure. Uh, when would you like to do that? Should we? Well, let's wait until we have them all online, and then we can can sort of take in the whole thing, and then have a conversation about that. Okay. Well, yeah. Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll just do this on Treasury Tuesday, then if that works, and we can just focus on the the Treasury aspect of yeah. it. Yeah, and we can talk about it next Wednesday as well, or or whenever. But it's okay. a good. Yeah. Sounds good. We'll table it then. Here. Uh, okay. Great. And then, so those are coming. We've got the uh, Q3 labs budget that's coming as I know Matt's working hard on that in terms of uh, working with people in their budgets and what we can expect there. Um, the last bit in terms of things that are currently in process is we have an external proposal. So Starfire and Matt and, and colleagues have worked on a proposal on optimism, which we've discussed in the past. Um, is there any update on that or should people just go take a look? Um, no update as of right now. Um, I would encourage everyone to, to go interact with the post and, and kind of bump the engagement. Um, from my understanding, the, the Optimism Delegate team is, is just working through the, all of the drafts that are on their, their governance form and um, just kind of taking it one by one. Um, so I think we're kind of at the, the whim of, of their work pace. Uh, but yeah, go boost the engagement if, if you guys have the time. Great. All right, we'll, we'll go check that one out. Um, okay. Um, then up hey. next, does anybody have anything else? Yeah, I was just going to say since uh, Joe is here. Joe, are you, you guys at the bank side doing anything with Optimism? Are you guys trying to get funding or anything? We are more focused on Polygon at the moment. Um, but I know there is interest in Optimism. However, we do not have an officially bridged presence over there yet. Got it. Okay. Let's figure it out. Cool. Okay. Um, anything else on anything that's currently in the pipeline in the first part of the agenda? All right. Then moving on. Um, in terms of current events, we often use this part to talk about things that are going on in the world, if they're big proposals, and we'll we'll come back to that shortly. But the one thing we wanted to highlight is something that's happening within Rook. So our, um, our studio team has been working on some UX testing. And so I put in the agenda uh, and I can also, I'll drop it in the governance chat, I guess, after this, but there's a link to um, a site. Oh, thank you, Tommy. So there's a link to, um, oh, the product team. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the product team is working on some, getting some UX feedback on the trading app. And so I've put a link, um, there's a site, if you go to it, that asks you to step through a couple of, of things in the trading in terms of how you do certain things on the app, and then asks you for feedback. So um, they've asked us to, to do that. I did it before the meeting. It was pretty interesting and, and didn't take very long. So please do go over and, and help them out. Um, okay, so yeah, is there, well, we'll come back to, to any other current events that are going on in the world. In terms of governance reform, so we talked about this a lot in the quarter end. Um, oh, thank you. So Wes just put it in the, in the voice chat. Um, we talked about governance reform a lot in the third quarter report, and we had a lot of meetings about it. So, um, and we didn't talk much about it last week, so we wanted to circle back and sort of give you an update on where things stand with that and also start workshopping some things. Um, so the we've talked a lot about the the kip draft about the front end of the process in terms of standardizing the format for kips and categories and templates we have some templates up um, as i said earlier matt has really 
done some great work that's prompted us to realize we need another category. Um, so again, these categories, um, they can seem kind of boring, but they really help us define what it is that the DAO governs. So um, it became clear that we needed another template and another category for things like core documents. So we've added that. Wes worked on a, um, a template that's linked in the, uh, in the agenda for today, but we'll make sure and get that onto the, onto the forum. So do take a look at that. But um, yeah, so in terms of things that are in development, there's an overall process kip, there's a SOFON framework. Um, and what I really wanted to talk today about was um, in working on the SOFON framework. So this is a, a separate kip that will say what it is that we expect of the SOFONs, what they're empowered to do, um, and really gets a lot more specific in terms of you know, what is their benefit to the DAO? What is their benefit to the community? What do we expect of them? How are they overseen? Um, because some of those pieces are still being worked out, especially where it intersects with the legal structure. We're not going to talk about that today, but I will say that in writing it um, and getting it ready to present to all of you for feedback, um, it became clear that onboarding and offboarding were intended to be part of that kit, but the kit was getting so long, given all of our discussions around transparency and reporting and accountability for the SOFONs, in order to work all of that in, it was necessary to take a step back and take out the offboarding and onboarding. Um, so that was one of the things we wanted to talk about today was just sort of open that up to comment. And also, since Hazard is here, if I can put you on the spot, um, I know we've, we've pro hopefully all read the beige paper, but I thought it would also be good to take a step back and say what you know, what, what is the purpose of the SOFONs and how do they fit into our process? So Hazard, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to, to call you on stage to talk us through that for a little bit. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The best way to think about SOFONs is, at least as originally written, are as, um, well, there's a lot of different ways to consider and think about a DAO. Um, let's say that it's a group of people, token holders, or whoever it is they're exercising governance uh, uh, rights. Um, but then there's likely a mission or a reason or a purpose for the DAO that you could say that the DAO has, right? So um, it, it's not just sort of day to day, whatever the group decides to do, there's kind of a will that belongs to the protocol or the DAO itself, you could say. Usually, uh, rather than talk about it in terms of like having a will, you would talk about it in terms of having a mission, right? Or having a purpose mm -hmm. or a charter and so on. And so the uh, purpose of SOFONs were to act as kind of the, you know, human embodiments of that will, the interpreters of that, uh, uh, in order to kind of, I think the phrase typically we, we'd use would be to speak for the protocol, to speak mm -hmm. for the protocol. And um, that has many different ways that it could be interpreted. One of it is to uh, use their, you know, uh, perhaps more um, uh, uh, informed point of view about the technical aspects of the protocol or of the industry or of, you know, finance or whatever to um, try to protect and recommend courses of action that would be uh, non-harmful or beneficial to the protocol to make mm -hmm. that information available to token holders, right? So if they could kind of learn uh, and uh, use that information to help inform their own decisions. Um, uh, to kind of act as a, uh, you know, we, we've seen things like um, governance attacks where basically if, as long as you can get a quorum, nobody really has to discuss anything, right, um, yeah. until it's sort of too late. And so in that sense, they also act as like a, a way to kind of know that some minimal amount of uh, subject matter experts have focused their attention on this matter for some amount of time. Somebody has looked at it and is aware of it and has raised any flags. There's due diligence built in, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the most succinct way to say it would be to say that they are uh, 
to speak for the protocol, right? Whatever that means, you know, that would depend on the protocol, right? But because the protocol can't speak for itself, you could argue that maybe it does, shouldn't, or doesn't. But uh, the assumption here is that it does, and that uh, that's what these folks are here to do, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so with that as as sort of the shape of what the sofons are, um, obviously the process of onboarding them and selecting the sofons becomes incredibly important. And so we have um, had the fortune of being able to operate under a KIP, which was KIP one. So it was our second KIP ever, and that was the KIP that I that nominated a set of sofons and um, elected them as a slate. Um, and so now that we're having a chance to revisit this, we have a chance to sort of look around and see how other projects have elected. Um, I, I wouldn't say any any project has something exactly like ours, but our SOFONs, in terms of how hazardous to describe them, have aspects of delegates in one form or another. So we can potentially learn from how other projects have done it um, in terms of nomination processes and voting processes and the like. Um, so given the, the description we have of what the SOFONs are and given you know, where things currently stand, I know a lot of people have mentioned in the past that they, they would like to address this issue of, of how we select the SOFON. So I really wanted to open the floor and ask if people had any thoughts or suggestions or, or things we should, should bear in mind as we move forward with this. Just a, a thought I had um, as I was working through these proposals in conjunction with with you, Jason, it reminded me kind of like one of the core pain points of the SOFON dilemma was the fact that they, they're experts in, in various fields mm -hmm. and they have limited time commitment that they can, they can provide towards reviewing yeah. um, proposals. And, and the role that you have assumed is, is kind of allowed for proposals that are placed in front of SOFONs um, to be almost like final form and uh, the the load on the SOFONs is lighter. Um, so I, th I think it's important to note that some of the original pain points of of the issues we had with, with our SOFONs have been um, alleviated to some degree. Um, so I think, I think that's worth keeping in mind as we kind of explore the onboarding and off offboarding with, with the SOFONs, because I think some of the SOFONs are, all the SOFONs we have right now are are rightfully placed in their role, um, mm -hmm. and I, I think we just need to, you know, bear in mind that some of the the pain points have kind of been uh, alleviated, and the and the load on the SOFONs have kind of has been lifted a little bit. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, one of the one of the reasons for focusing so much on the front end of the process in the KIPs we've been working on so far is to try and standardize as much of that and also try and make sure that there's as there's a lot of deliberation that happens before something goes to the SOFONs. Um, but that's a point well taken. A uh, question like doesn't this like centralize part of the process with you specifically Jason isn't that like an issue? Um, it is for now but I would argue I've needed to do that in order to understand what the templates should be and what kinds of standards we should be able to, to impose. So a, a lot of my involvement has been, um, I don't think I could have made meaningful recommendations and go forward to make meaningful recommendations without that. Um, so I'd say, yeah, it, it's a temporary situation as I get to learn what's going on. And I would also say the, you know, the, the larger, overall process KIP that we're working on explicitly names a set of governance stewards. Um, doesn't, you know, actually there are no names for them individually, but there's, um, the vision for this is to have a group of people who operate somewhat like the governance facilitators at MakerDAO in terms of making sure that the front end of the process moves, that it um, adheres to certain standards and that things are set up in such a way that when, when things are ready for the community, that they, they're standardized and they meet a certain standard of providing information and so on. 
So yeah, it's a question of temporary centralization, but the goal is not necessarily to keep it that way. It's, it's to take the benefits of what we have now and try and standardize them. And is it also to make sure cell phones are less like busy with administrative tasks and stuff and can focus more on like the important stuff? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's to remove any of the administrative things that they might be expected to do um, and don't, don't generally have time to do. Um, but also, I would say we're, and that's a great question, I, we will come right back to that. The, the other thing is that we're, you know, we're also expecting more of the cell phones. So we're removing part of the framework is to remove responsibilities for anything administrative. But we're also, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, proposing to have them comment more on the forum in the community review part. So the goal isn't necessarily just to wholesale reduce their responsibilities, it's to refocus and retarget them on things that are going to be of the greatest benefit to the community. Um, so Aya, you had a question, are the expertise areas of SOFONS explicitly stated? So it's not so much the expert, this is a great question. So in the original nomination of the, the SOFONS, which was in KIP1, um, on the forum and on, in GitHub, we, um, yeah. So it, on the original nomination, the, the cell phones were drawn from the community and from core contributors. And so their, um, their backgrounds were mentioned in the nomination process. Um, and also that nominating document, by the way, noted that in future, we might wanna have keepers and market makers also represented in the cell phones. But at the moment, the representation is for community members and contributors. And can that be mapped to explicit cell phones as we can see and learn from their arguments? Yeah, so not currently, but um, this is another question I had. So can these expertise areas be mapped to explicit cell phones so we can see and learn from their arguments? So um, correct me if I'm getting your question wrong, but the way I'm understanding this and, and the way we're thinking about this is to make sure that in the future, whenever the SOFONs are delivering a decision, that they are individually accountable and will be tracked for how often they do this for justifying and providing their individual view on something. So in addition to everything we have now in terms of the SOFONs reaching rough consensus, we're expecting to ask them, I mean, that my proposal is that we expect to ask them to communicate how they would vote individually and why. And also when they're involved in the forum earlier on in the process, to, of course, have to, you know, provide questions and feedback and, and so on. So I'm not sure that answers your question, but please let me know. Yeah, well, Joe, do you want to expand on that? I think it's a really important point. It is very parallel to my position as a GSE, or Governance Solution Engineer, within Bankless DAO. One of yeah. our emergent problems we had as we all got excited at working at Bankless was we all got so focused on working in the DAO, we forgot to work yeah. on the DAO, and we had a prioritization problem where nobody had the bandwidth, despite the fact that we recognized those were problems that needed to be solved. And until we elected a team specifically to do that, the problems were recognized but not well addressed. And in that respect, Hazard's statements about being the voice of the protocol is highly resonant with what I understand that to be. Yeah. It, it does create a certain level of centralization in the respect that there is a responsibility to the duties of that position. Yeah. But the execution has to happen at a human level and if you can't assign that to an individual it won't get done so you do have to bring it down to that level at some point the key is you leave the power within the office and not with the individual it is a responsibility not an authority and by creating that sort of mindset the execution of the will of the public is inherent within the office and as such they may have their personal opinions but they are also going to be duty bound to represent their constituency and if we're talking about onboarding and offboarding 
the ability to create a vote of no confidence if they abrogate that responsibility mm -hmm. in favor of personal agenda is something mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. I don't know if it is or not, but yeah. if it is, then that is all of the checks and balances that the public needs in order for the SOFONs to act in that capacity for the DAO. And the distinctions of them working on the DAO is such that it also alleviates some of the pressures on those who are working in the DAO because they can actually focus on doing the things that they are specializing in best. So it is a self-care mechanism of the organization. And it is definitely emergent within many different structures I see in the industry. It's mm -hmm. got different names depending on where you go, but functionally, we're all doing the same thing. So right. I believe that as far as steps forward, it is the right choice to empower these guys. Gotcha. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, are the SOFONs, so I had a great question. Are SOFONs working on the DAO though, or just filtering proposals? Yeah, so we're, we're not looking to them to filter necessarily. Um, so their, their primary role um, now and in the future plan as well is to, to review proposals and make sure that they act uh, on behalf of the protocol overall and on behalf of the community. And so that every proposal is reviewed, as Hazard said, by SMEs who, who really understand it. Um, well, I should clarify, and this is a, I should, it's important to dig into this because um, this is a point of contention that arises sometimes. Um, yeah. So by saying that there should, that every proposal should be reviewed, the way the governance works is that that would mean we do have a separate step for crowd consensus so that, you know, there's sufficient right. interest in a proposal to actually be reviewed, have it be reviewed. Uh, that's at the time that was mostly for bandwidth limiting, right? Just mm -hmm. because, like we've all discussed, like so funds have a limited amount of time and so on. Right. So it's sort of um, you see more protocolized ways to do this in other uh, protocols sometimes, where you have to have a certain number of, I don't know, upvotes or pass a certain number of like temperature checks or whatever. There's there's some process to say like people actually care about this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, there's been I think there's been a couple times when um, something uh did get to that point but there's a there can be especially at times of kind of low engagement a temptation to conflate things that aren't interesting to things that just aren't getting reviewed or getting getting sort of filtered right yeah. so is it the case that so you know if so funds are making the choice of what has consensus like crowd consensus or whatever and is reviewable then it is kind of like filtering, right? Mm -hmm. And you could also use that to, you know, just what what I if the system works properly, what you would imagine is that so funds will be delivered stinkers that they will not be able to recommend in good faith, right? right? Uh, so we want to see some of that happening, and it, it, that's sort of paradoxical, but it that would mean that you know there is actual independent. Um, stuff happening and that there's less influence, you know, uh, in the, that screening process mm -hmm. from so funds. Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, Joe asks, is there a framework for them to work by when assessing proposals? We don't currently have one. Um, we are thinking about things like, a, I mean, well, first of all, we, we are sorely lacking, but we're not sorely lacking. We have, we're going to update our mission and value statements. So that's going to be sort of a broader framework. Um, as far as a tighter framework, that um, is something we should definitely develop. I, you know, it can be as loose as a code of conduct or it could be something very specific. And I'd be very curious to know what your thoughts are about that. I think that specific is absolutely something that you're going to want to go by. Yep. Um, these guys, as it's been described, are specialists within their specific areas. And so that is something that goes outside of the general scope. And we would expect them to bring that unique expect it, 
adopted perspective to those proposals. But when they do, they're going to need rationale for those unique areas because it is situational by nature. Outside of that, they should be at the very least asking some base level questions on every proposal, which is, you know, existential protection of the protocol if they are its voice. That's, is this going to reduce or or is it going to create negative externalities? Is this going to be something that gets us closer to our mission vision? You know, is it well aligned? Is this something that is within the parameters of our cultural guidelines? And by asking those sorts of base level questions with every proposal, they can act as a sort of white blood cell check against anything that's coming into the ecosystem. And if they have any red flags, that's where they are performing that filtering that everybody's talking about. It's not that they're shooting down things just willy nilly. It's that, hey, this has something that fails our health check. It's potentially toxic to our organization. So we need to examine it closer, change its model, or its presentation, or reject it as something that is toxic. Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent point, and we can work that out. The what we've done so far in in those terms is push a lot of that thinking into the templates and requiring people to talk about whether what they're proposing is mission aligned and to demonstrate that and to um, and to address some of these points, like what are the downsides, but you're absolutely right. Turning that into a more explicit set of guidelines for the SOFONs is really necessary. Yeah, white blood cells is an excellent analogy. It uh, also yeah. gives the community a touch point to make sure whether or not the SOFONs are acting in the interest with which they have been put into the position, because an abrogation yeah. of that metric becomes highly visible in yep. a scenario where they have those things to measure against. Yeah, that's a great point, because one of the things we've been throwing around um, internally, and we've, we've talked about it in, I can't remember, we talked about it two or three weeks ago, was thinking about how to measure what the cell phones are doing. And so we, it, it's pretty easy to do quantitative measures, right? Like how many decisions have they individually released? How many times did they individually participate on the forum? And that's all well and good, but that doesn't get at the really important stuff, which is what you were just talking about, Joe, in terms of the qualitatively, are these decisions useful? Are they helpful? Are they aligned? And are these getting what we're expecting from, from them? Likewise, that also creates a point where anything that the community feels dissatisfied with may highlight gaps within the SOFON's current mm -hmm. workload and responsibilities. And bringing attention to those friction points may solve problems before they emerge. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, too. Related to what Joe was talking about, I had a prior question yeah. where I believe he talked about the SOFONs in the original kit were mentioned by name with their areas of expertise, but it wasn't clear to me that the SOFONs in general had designated areas of expertise because presumably over time there is going to be onboarding and offboarding. And mm -hmm. has the time been taken to find like, hey, these are the areas of expertise we need to make sure to have in our SOFONs so that the role really is about something for the DAO and not just individual people? Yeah, no, that's a great point. That kind of, I mean, there's two things you would want from, like there's, so if we can think about SOFONs as having constituencies in terms of those who come from certain groups, in terms of, I mean, they shouldn't have constituencies, right? They should be thinking about the project overall, but in terms of their background and their expertise, but yeah, in terms of thinking about what explicitly we want. I mean, one of the questions I have and one of the things I'm wrestling with is do we apportion certain amounts of SOFONs in terms of expecting, like, let's say we have six, do we expect two to have protocol expertise, two to be people who think very intensively about integrations, given that those are a lot of our proposals and do we expect some amount to be really focused on treasury investments because we're an unusual DAO in terms of the kinds of things we vote on you know we're not a protocol DAO where we're fine-tuning every single token that we whitelist on the protocol and we're not necessarily tuning much with the protocol yet because it's so new 
and we're not yet voting on a lot of products, but we may in the near future. So, you know, aligning what we expect, what we really need expertise on with, with where we're going is really important. Uh, that's exactly what I was getting to. Glad it was received. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Just making notes here. Yeah, and then the question is how we go about doing that, right? Like, how do we make sure? It's almost like we have to have an end goal in mind before we, we work backwards to how we're going to onboard people. But if we think about this, you know, this question of expertise and they're expected to have expertise and they're expected to bring that to, on behalf of the protocol. And if we're going to expect them to participate in the forum and to, to give their decisions and recommendations individually about proposals, then that does kind of tell us, I think initially, at least in terms of what kinds of expertise we're looking for and how we might bring it to bear. But it also raises the question, uh, related question, which is, um, you know, do we, if we expect this to be a much larger role, should there be compensation attached? And my assumption and belief would be yes, but I'd be very curious to know. And given that that's going to affect how we onboard people, I would love to get um, other people's thoughts on that. If it requires time to perform, mm -hmm. then not compensating for that is asking for failure. You should not muzzle the ox that grinds the grain, as some ancient texts tend to say. And mm -hmm. There is wisdom in that. If you starve the ox, then the work stops being done, and it doesn't matter that you have the grain. You, you need to take care of the sustainability of the ecosystem in order to create the perpetuation of the profitability. If you take care of that first, then the rest of the fertility of the system is reinforcing, and from that you can grow. But you absolutely have to make sure that your basic needs are met first. And if you aren't providing that, then you cannot reasonably expect the position to be filled with the caliber of people that you need it to be filled with to perform the duty to the expectations you have. I second that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Yeah, it's, especially as we start asking for more. Although I also want to say that we have not historically paid our SOF funds and they've they've been really dedicated to the task and really up for it. And I think some of them actually expressed some desire not to be compensated in the past. But as we move forward, that it just seems like it's best practice and it's logical for all the reasons that you know Joe has just brought in front of us and it makes a lot of sense. But I'd be very curious to hear if anybody has an opposing view because I want to make sure we hear everything. I don't necessarily have an opposing view. I, I, I echo your point no. about it's been done for free as it stands now, and we haven't really had any issues. At least once since you came in, I think that the process has been pretty smooth. But I guess just one thing I would like to kind of see in relation to this question is really, I think the important factor is how are they off-boarded? Because mm -hmm. if the DAO is the one that's paying for them, maybe there could be a situation where the DAO doesn't really like, or, or some portion of the DAO doesn't really like a, a decision that was made. They're like, well, let's fire them, let's stop paying them. Um, and, and I don't know what the offboarding procedures are there. So understanding how pay intertwines with the offboarding process may be something to consider as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, too, it's important to recognize that even though some kind of uh, remuneration would be offered, you know, it's always about levels and we all already know there there can be a lot of conflicting ideas there. so if you're there's expertise and an expectation of a certain amount of real time given which means like you expect to have the visibility so that people can learn and understand sofans and even grow into them which over time right even if you have great people now who are the start of the beginning and happy to just do it you know over time I don't think that's going to work for the organization, like Dupe said, in its best interest. So it's just, it's finding that balance and 
like was just stated, there needs to be some way, because I don't think it's just like, oh, you know, a bunch of shareholders or rook holders are upset. We need to get rid of so funds. That also mm-hmm. needs checks and balances too. Mm-hmm. And another thing I'll say regarding compensation is, I, th- I think that's like recurring compensation, right? But I also think there's an incentive alignment side of this. So we could also, and I'm not saying I want to require this, but if there is a requirement that they have to hold a certain amount of rook, that almost in- ensure not ensures, but it, it better uh, increases the chances of success that they are truly aligned with the protocol. Like I think we all want that. Um, and aligning them through compensation is one way so that they know that, you know, they, they want to make sure that the DAO is taken care of so that they keep getting paid to keep making decisions. But if they have a very large bag of Rook, they're incentivized to do what it takes to make sure that that appreciates and that, that they have incentives um, through through ma- that mechanism versus recurring payment. I actually think that should be X Rook. Uh, and some people have seen my post about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, I meant to, a quick parenthetical, I meant to discuss this earlier. Thank you, Aya, for bringing that up. So um, Paisho is working with uh, someone on a community grant to develop the plugin on um, for Snapshot to enable us to to sort of fine-tune the, chain, the, the enhancement that Hazard made in terms of enabling extra people to vote. And so we're working on how to weight those appropriately. So that is coming, but still in the works. Um, okay, so sorry, but to get back to this, yeah, checks and balances and offboarding. Um, yeah, offboarding is a tough one, right? Like it's the question of, I think that having this um, sort of the decision making guide that Joe mentioned will be a huge help, and being able to track them will be a huge help. But this idea of checks and balances, I mean, one of the, I will say that one of the challenges and the thing that's that might be holding up the, the kips the most about the process is that the way we're set up now, the cell phones are invested with a lot of um, sort of power, but there's not really anybody above the cell phones. And so who intervenes to when the cell phones in the community don't agree? Um, and that is, that, that is something we're certainly working on, but that's obviously something that will come in in the event of offboarding and in the event that... Um, yeah, the point that Matt brought up in terms of what happens if a block of token holders suddenly they decide they don't like the sofons or they want to remove the sofons and you know what are the specific mechanisms for that? So yeah, I realize I'm just throwing this out there and it's a big thing, but would be very curious to hear. Um, yeah, if anybody has any thoughts over about how we might sort of bound the sofons in terms of someone to step in and reconcile because that's obviously something we're going to have to do in terms of offboarding. So maybe I'll, you know, start, that was a badly formed question. I would say, who would we see intervening in the event that we're thinking about these checks and balances? And even just in a very idealized sense. Uh, I'll chime in here. Um, when I was looking at MakerDAO, they have, they have token holders, so they have offboarding um, their facilitators of their core units, which like each core unit is think of it like a pillar, like Rook Labs. So mm-hmm. um, these these facil- facilitators um, get offboarded via a vote. Now, most of them, pretty much all of them, except for one, have been voluntary, where someone kind of submits a proposal on the forum saying, "Hey, I'm stepping down in whatever a month." But uh, there was one that kind of stood out to me where Rune kind of posted one about offboarding someone. And uh, since he has like 75,000 maker, um, it really wasn't voluntary. Um, so, so that's kind of, I guess, the one option we could do, which I am not necessarily a fan of. But um, just to get the conversation going. What is... Uh, what is I was going to say, I have an idea that's just coming through. It's just an idea, but in terms of incentive alignment, um, as opposed to just rook holders, and I actually think it's kind of cool to have rook holders have some voting power. So I, I'm thank you for the update. Um, but let's say people who've demonstrated 
uh, alignment with the protocol and its vision by being extra holders for a certain amount of time and then a quorum of those people. So at least if it was a takeover attack, it would have to be long range, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That, that, and that's also something that um, we're looking at in terms of snapshot. It's a little harder to do time weighted just given the way our staking contracts work, but we may be migrating, you know, the staking contract may be um, maybe part of a future protocol update. You never know. So we may be able to do that sooner rather than later, which would be great. The As, as usual with these things, the uh, the failure state is typically not going to be an extreme case because in an extreme case you could always have recourse to like literally just make a bespoke kip yeah. to remove this person and run it through the normal process. Obviously, they would need to be recused as so fond from reviewing their own a proposal for their own dismissal. Mm -hmm. And if there's other so funds bought into this fact that the community was bringing that this person is uh, toxic or whatever, then you know that's that's one way to skin that cat. I think the more likely and uh, insidious uh, failure mode is that um, you just sort of have a bunch of uh, maybe one or two SOFONs who um, just kind of have a philosophical point of view that is not, it, it, you can't really fault them for if it's, you know, uh, honestly held and so on, but it's just not in step with um, what a large, maybe vocal, uh, you know, contingent of token holders uh, believe or whatever. And there's kind of a legitimacy problem, right? right? Um, ideally all of these things are tied to, you know, objective assessments based on credible, you know, expertise and so on. And the fact that the SOFONs are really only publishing a recommendation at the end of the day, rather than exercising kind of, kind of voting power, you know, kind of relieves them of some of the, you know, heavier burden that they'd have if they were actually making a decision. Um, but I, I think that's the the more likely scenario, right? Once you get towards the extremes, like you can probably manage to just use the normal governance mechanism to get somebody out, but it's in that middle area where it could get a little tricky, right? As I understand it, then the SOFONs only have soft power. Well, I don't want to speak. I, I'm not exactly sure about the new revisions and stuff, but the way that it works, the way that the voting works, the token holder voting works, is that it's objection voting. So um, what SOFONs do is essentially tell everybody what they think, right? And now if you're kind of a disengaged voter or you kind of just, you trust the SOFONs or whatever, you're not here for that or you're not here that week for that or whatever, something that just doesn't uh, mean a lot to you, some particular proposal, then you don't have to vote, right? Because it's objection voting. You have to vote if you if you object. But uh, the snapshot in this case is somewhat misleading because snapshot doesn't allow objection voting yet. We haven't put a patch in for it. But um, technically, you could just basically just not vote, and not voting would signal, you know, that you consent to whatever the thing was. You don't speak up. But another way to look at that is that you delegate your um, perspective to the SOFUN's perspective, right? If they say looks good, then it looks good to you, and so you don't need to vote. If they say it looks bad, then maybe you, you know, get up and vote object if you agree with them that it looks bad or something. But um, they're kind of just uh, guideposts. They're not actually swaying. So, so for example, if SOFUN say, no, this is a bad deal, we don't want to do this, the matter still goes to vote. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if there were a black hat SOFON, then they are limited in their capacity to inflict damage on the DAO, even if they are not able to be removed from the position because their contributions will be, by the community, considered invalid, even if it's not necessarily a formal vote. Is yeah, that correct? The most they could do would be to have a toxic opinion about something and perhaps prevent consensus from forming among SOFONs, so delaying things, or um, uh, publishing misleading, uh, you know, if we get to the point like Jason wants, where we have more um, of this discussion attributed to particular SOFONs and published and so on as guidance, 
They could be publishing misleading or whatever, you know, just. And stuff. these publishings are all on the forums, correct? Correct. Uh, I don't think we have an answer, but I mean, yeah, sure. But it would essentially be like yeah, talking and misleading or stuff, but they wouldn't be able to force something through. So the system as a whole is, it tries to be somewhat fail safe and that the worst that can happen is that nothing happens, which can be bad in some situations, right? But that's, it's hard to proactively force something to happen, even as a black hat. You'd have to have quite a lot of, um, uh, well, it's not even a matter of stake. Like you would have to slip it past all of the so funds and then all of the token holders so that nobody managed to wake up and object to this thing, right? Then in terms of offboarding and rubber meets the road, who do the soper so or who do the sofons report to? It sounds like it's whoever the communications admins are on these platforms we're using. And whoever those people are would have that responsibility to maintain and uh, uphold the communications of the rest of the organization. I'm not sure I follow. So how would how would that work? So if we are admins on the platform, we have the capability to ban members. And if we have a black hat SOFON and they aren't able to force through a decision and griefing attacks and just bad information kind of propagation are the things mm -hmm. that they are capable of, a user ban is more than capable of shutting off that kind of problem. I see. And so as such, there is your mitigation strategy. Yeah, you could imagine a scenario in which so funds are essentially an optimization layer and they could just be appointed, right? Because again, they don't exercise decision power. They're only kind of governance oracles or like, you know, like uh, proposal oracles to help guide voters who don't have the time or the expertise or whatever to go over things and to kind of serve as like default delegates in the sense that if you're not objecting, then you, you're consenting and go with the flow of whatever the soap on say. But um, there is this more, there, there is a piece of what the SOFONs do or could do that is somewhat important, which is, well, A, there's reconciliation, and then B, there is this matter of, um, you know, uh, at least in a soft way, perhaps, determining crowd consensus or determining when uh, a matter is, uh, you know, reviewable or whatever, you know, like so they could trap something in some kind of endless review process or something like that, I guess. Like there are some forms of, Mm, stalling, let's call it, I don't know, that could be uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. The griefing attack is definitely a potential problem in the United States. That's kind of what the filibuster is being used as politically right now. Yeah. And I think if we were to draw some parallels between those sorts of debates, you might be able to infer some conclusions, even if that is that our modern society hasn't solved that problem even on a nation state level yet. Right. And so at the moment, yeah, completely agree. And at the moment, the proposal is to set time bounds or time boundaries in terms of how long something is on the forum before it goes to the you know, it can be signaled to the SOFONs and also how long the SOFONs have. And of course, these are extendable if someone asks for more time and justifies it. But the idea is to make sure that there's some structure around it. And maybe we don't move forward with that, but that's, that's currently the idea. And there could certainly be more around that. The other idea that's somewhere out there, for what it's worth, is that the author of the proposal should be the one to drive this process. And so if even if there's nobody else giving them feedback and they really feel strongly about this, like it's it should be on them to kind of continue to advocate for this and put it in front of people and so funds and whatever, because uh, I mean, you know, now that Jason's here and some other folks, it's good, but ultimately, um, you know, the author shouldn't expect to just throw a proposal over the fence and then later complain that nobody swarmed all over it and, you know, started some machinery into motion or something. That's just not really, reasonable expectation. Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the, the working idea is that the, the author triggers some sort of signal that they want to move to the next step for the SOFONs. 
in that spirit. Great. Well, it sounds to me like the vote of no confidence, which would be the Sophons acting negatively against the contributor that brings up a proposal like that, that is the only remaining process that needs to be fleshed out in mm -hmm. order to create a complete framework for Sophons to be implemented. And based off of their function within the organization, I think they are a complete necessity. And as that is the base mindset from which to move forward, the iteration should come after the first implementation because doing will yield more insight than discussing will. And as such, I think it sounds like just Fleshing that piece out and pushing it forward to the community is all that remains in order for that to be a viable step forward for the RIP community. Great. And I also think getting, um, I really like this idea of a decision making, um, a set of criteria. So that I think would also be part of maybe that proposal in terms of how we would onboarding, evaluation, and offboarding. Maybe those would all be. Linked. Okay, great. Well, that that was a phenomenal conversation. Thank you, everybody. Is there anything else as we're we're getting close to the hour? Is there anything we we haven't covered? I think we we have a good sort of set of things to work on going into next week, which is great. Are we going to be moving this to the bi-weekly? Matt, fantastic point to bring up here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was going to make a quick announcement at the end of this. Um, Jason, are you solid on your agenda? Are we ready to kind of move into housekeeping and, and wrap this up? Yeah, I'm good on my agenda for sure. Awesome. So yeah, so looking at um, our, uh, let's call them community calls as a whole, we'll be making um, some, some modifications to our scheduling going forward. So um, what we'll still continue to have is Treasury Tuesday, every Tuesday. Um, excited for that to continue. That's been a fantastic call led by Matt. Um, looking at governance workshops, as we see the ebbs and flows of proposal cadences and, and needs for, for working through things, what we're looking at doing is moving this governance workshop to um, you know every other Wednesday. And so what we will do on those interim Wednesdays is instead hold a community office hours um, that, that'll be hosted by me, but we'll also have some other contributors that show up there as well. And this will be more of a um, kind of opportunity for feedback. We can talk through governance stuff. If it does come up, we can talk through questions about the protocol or or anything else as well but we'll we'll be um yeah handling that more as like a yeah community office hours um so so that will be on the the wednesdays that don't have a um a, a governance workshop and then based off of how last friday went we're going to continue this model of a instead of town hall we're going to be rebranding this to the Rook DAO status update, and it'll be happening bi weekly as well. So, um, next week we'll have our next Rook DAO status update that'll have, um, you know, governance, treasury, and the rest of labs updates um, as well. Um, but we will uh, move that to, to every other week as well. And then, um, in the works right now, is um, separate events that will happen on Fridays. And some ideas that have been kicked around, nothing formalized, could be um, you know different types of Twitter spaces that we'll host on Fridays, whether it's discussions around MEV, bringing in uh, other communities for AMAs, uh, or other ideas. We're, we're still working through what that'll look like. But in terms of what the calendar will look like on a weekly basis, we'll be updating our 
Google Calendar that that will showcase this. So this should that should be updated later tonight. That will reflect um, going to this new every other week for governance workshops, every other week for the RookDAO status update, and then. Um, as we are building out and, and finalizing new events, we'll be adding those to that as well. Uh, and, and also the, uh, the, the community office hours that I'll be hosting on the every other Wednesday that there's not a governance workshop. So yeah, so exciting kind of changes around different community calls, really trying to find the sweet spot of what's gonna maximize the value for folks that come in and participate that, um, you know, make sure that every call that we do has, um, you know, the, the right uh, agenda. It's accomplishing things. It's not wasting anybody's time. So, so we're really excited to kind of see these changes starting to roll out. And yes, so we'll, we'll be rolling out this first change, which is moving governance workshops to every other week. Yeah, sounds good. And just to be clear, like we're the, the every other Wednesday when it's not. So we uh, yeah, we're not going to do it. But we're you can think about this as like governance process workshop where we're workshopping changes to the process itself. Um, but anything and everything having to do with governance is still on the table for the alternating Wednesdays as well. So if there's a proposal that really needs discussion or or people have questions about the process as it is or have questions about what's going forward, you know, sp please still bring those to to the alternating Wednesdays as well. Right, you know, and, and the focus for this is, is that we do have between governance workshops and Treasury Tuesdays, a lot of the um, ability for the DAO to work through proposals and different types of conversations in those calls specifically too. So I really wanna use those to enable them to help drive consensus and do that on, on a regular basis. But that said, you know, there may be proposals that might be more time sensitive that might have uh, been proposed at a different time that there might not have been a call and we want to talk about a little sooner. We'll have those other calls that will have the opportunity to bring the community forward to, to speak on those topics as well. All right, sounds good. Well. Good change is coming. So I uh, thank you everybody for coming again. This was a great session. We certainly are going forward with a lot more, more ideas about how to address this and I look forward to revisiting with everybody in the future. Awesome. Well, Jason, thanks for hosting here. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and sign this one up. All right, take care everyone.